Here in the Crisis Command Centre, three people who've never met will be put in an extraordinary position of power as they take over the reins of government and run this country during a simulated national emergency. They have volunteered to be ministers and tonight they'll discover if they've got what it takes to survive at the very top. They are William Atkinson, head teacher of a West London school. These people have not been sentenced to death and I don't think it's any part of my job to sentence them to death. However, I have to look at the greatest good. Penny Streeter, MD of a recruitment agency. I know you're going to create mass panic and we're not going to be able to go back on this. I think you're going to make a decision here that you're going to live to regret. Jason Kingsley, CEO of a multimedia company. I still think we've got to avoid poisoning. I mean, we could be killing thousands if we let the chemical factory go up. The ministers will not be alone in making their decisions. Helping them will be three genuine experts with real-life experience of crisis management. They are Sir Tim Garden, military advisor. Amanda Platel, communications expert. Charles Shoebridge, emergency services specialist. We have a national emergency, and it's about to begin. Ministers, uh, you have been brought here to the command center because we have a potential crisis on our hands. And I'd like to take you immediately to have a look at these news reports. A hurricane warning has been issued by the Met Office. Gusts of around 100 miles an hour are forecast to sweep the UK over the next few hours. The Coast Guard are on red alert with forced 12 winds and 30-foot waves expected in the North Sea. Millions of people are on alert as an already waterlogged Britain braces itself for the worst floods in living memory. And things look set to get worse, with weathermen predicting the equivalent of three weeks' rain in the next 24 hours. The army have been drafted into low-lying coastal areas to help communities prepare for the unusually high spring tide. In many places, sea defences, which have taken a battering during recent heavy weather, are not expected to survive. Ministers, of course, I'll bring you uh, more reports as, as we get them. But there is an additional threat that so far the public and the media don't know about. And that's why you've been brought here. And I'd like to connect you to Thames Barrier Control. We've just been informed by the Met Office there's been a sudden drop of pressure in the centre of that storm in the North Sea. Now this, combined with 100 mile an hour winds, means that the water has risen 1.3 metres above normal. Uh, this is known as a storm surge. Now we see these surges from time to time, but what concerns us about this one is that it comes on top of an unusually high spring tide. Now if these winds continue and the surge reaches the Thames estuary, it could force its way up the Thames overwhelming the tidal defences. Now, this would mean, of course, that parts of London could become flooded. This, of course, ministers, is privileged information, and you now know there's a possibility uh, that London may flood. What you have to decide is what you're going to do with this information. And the first decision for you is this. Do you want to warn no one, just warn the authorities, or also warn the public? With each dilemma the ministers face, they must choose the correct option as decided by a team of professional crisis managers. They can call upon their advisers at any time. If we can get our communications person here on spreading this information, um, we feel that the local authorities should be alerted. Um, how, how would we carry this message? Doesn't the public have a right to know? I mean, if there's one thing the British public's used to, it's bad weather. Mm -hmm. um, you've got 1.2 million Londoners. We're, we don't want to alarm at a, a too flooding. early stage. Yeah? But certainly, I think we need to inform the authorities so the contingencies they have can be put into place. And then we want to, I believe, want to see how the situation is developing before we start alarming people. If we delay making the decision to warn the public f to avoid panic, are we going to be in a position to make that decision and affect you know, public safety? Well, you're certainly before, before we get your input on that, uh, Charles, I think that at this stage, on the knowledge that we've got, warning the authorities is a decision I think we ought to make. And then that will give us the time to assess the data as it comes in uh, so we don't panic. 
yeah, we don't overreact, yeah, but what we do is commensurate to the, the threat based on the intelligence we've got. Well, certainly, Minister, <laughs> if you were to take that course of action, it would greatly facilitate any evacuation decision were you to take one later on down the line, of course. I, I don't think we've got any choice. I don't what you, what you guys I agree think. with you, Jason. But I think we've got to warn the authorities for a start. I think warning the public might be a bit premature, although I don't feel I've got enough data. <coughs> Minister, I mean, uh, you are in charge of this crisis, um, but again, I just want to put to you that it is possible that later someone might say, you knew, but you didn't tell us. We're going Absolutely. to, we're going that, to tell them. As ministers, we carry this responsibility, and we've got responsibility for what what happens afterwards, but we've also got a responsible for dealing with the emerging crisis and dealing appropriately uh, with that crisis. OK, are you all agreed on this, that the only people to be told here are the authorities? Minister? Yes, I'm in agreement with that. What about you? I think as long as we are fully prepared to tell the public as soon as we know that there actually is a, a significant crisis that needs them to be alerted and as soon as we've got the authorities ready to handle Minister, the potential Minister, I seem panic. to take you want to be straight with the public. You almost want to have it both ways, don't you? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's important to well, be I, straight I, with the public. Well, Absolutely. Well, but you've got to decide because you yeah. are now in a situation where you're taking very critical decisions. Hmm. Absolutely. So which is the it to be? No. Uh, my best solution to this would be to warn the authorities and then cascade that warning down to the public within a when we're told the authorities actually are in a position. So, Minister, is, is this a decision or a fudge? Um, this is a decision, but unfortunately, I think that we need more details than the, the, well, the choices we've currently I, got. In I front will of share us. with you what we know. Yeah. So, in the situation, so in my opinion, warn the authorities. All right, ministers, you seem to be in agreement here, and your decision will be enacted. Thank you. Only informing the authorities is the wrong decision. The Environment Agency states that the best way to prepare for a flood is to warn everyone. It is now accepted that people rarely panic in the face of such a crisis. An informed public is more likely to help themselves. The storm surge is devastating the vulnerable East Coast. The effects of climate change, the rising sea level and large-scale land subsidence have rendered many of the existing sea defences inadequate. The threat to London is mounting. Ministers, there are further developments you should know about. And the death toll from the storm is rising. This just coming in from Great Yarmouth. Three people were killed when their caravan was overturned and destroyed by the hurricane force winds. Elsewhere in the town, two people are missing after a 20-foot wave swept over sea defences. What police describe as a wall of water has wrecked buildings on the seafront. A massive power cut has blacked out the entire city of Norwich. Electricity pylons that supply the area have been downed by the hurricane force winds, leaving around 100,000 homes without power. Uh, the weather conditions are causing havoc all over Britain, but I also have the Metropolitan Police from their incident centre down in the east of London. Uh, we are getting regular updates on the surge tide and we are taking every precaution that we can. Uh, I do have to tell you, however, that we are desperately short of manpower and if the worst does happen, we're going to need them for um, sandbagging, uh, evacuation, rescue. So we don't have much time and we need to be prepared. Ministers, the quickest way uh, to sort this out and to increase uh, resources in London, of course, is to bring in the army. Uh, but at the moment, uh, this will mean diverting resources from the East Coast. And you've got a choice here, Ministers. Do you want to send the army to London or leave the army on the East Coast? So, Tim, can you perhaps give us a, some advice on the consequences of moving from the East Coast to London? Certainly, mm -hmm. Minister. Covering, uh, at the moment, Suffolk, Essex and Kent, I've got 1,800 troops there. And you've seen what the conditions are like. Mm. The, 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 the Blackouts, etc. Well, I, I, mm. and we've got troops filling sandbags, we've got troops rescuing people. Uh, this is where the storm is. This is where uh, they are defending against it. In, in 53, 300 people died in this area, mm -hmm. and this is worse than 1953. Okay, there's absolute certainty if we would, at this point in this uh, developing situation, if we were to move the troops out of East Anger, uh, we would be putting people's life at risk. 
and there's no doubt about that because we can see the level of devastation taking place and that is with the armed forces supporting that. We haven't told the public either because if they, if they suddenly see the army being diverted to London, the media are going to pick up on it straight away. But, I, I, Minister, that is, you know, as with all these crises, it is about the kind of images that get projected. I mean, you've got to decide what do you want to see on the 6 o'clock news. I mean, do you want to see the, the troops moving away? Look at it. It's Caravan City. We're talking about protecting some old grannies. That's yeah. a bit harsh. They are people. It's a harsh world, Minister. You have London to protect here. You have a very simple choice. You either pull our troops out of this very deprived area and you get them and protect and you get them to protect the heart there's of the country. There's a real and present danger there, Amanda. There's yeah? Also, there's also there's a, a real potential. Danger to the city yeah, but my friend, there's a potential down the road and we are assessing that situation as it develops. Certainly at the moment, we know the storm is raging there. We know people. Uh, lives Minister, are being put it at risk. We too know, late Amanda. to do it later. That's all I say. Perhaps I could come in with some um, figures for you, Ministers. Um, you've got extremely uh, high-density housing along the Thames Estuary. You've also, of course, got quite heavy concentrations of industry, particularly uh, chemicals, um, businesses, telecommunications. Uh, the potential, if this eventuality occurs in London, is, of course, quite... Uh, Catastrophic. I, th I think it's um, a situation where we need to look at the impact and where potentially the biggest loss of life could be. And, you know, it's, it's not a fantastic situation to be in, but we need to minimise loss of life. My, my no. decision would be to move the troops to London. Before I move the troops, I'd like to know just a bit more about what we're leaving behind. We have got local authorities working in that part of the country. They've got their own resources. OK, they're not enough. But nevertheless, the troops have been deployed for a period of time there, supporting that, doing the sandbagging, etc. I'm sure, Amanda, mm. that the people in that area have been warned about okay. clearly what they're experiencing. Minister, the before... weather's its own warning, uh, you know, at the moment, for those people. They know what's going on. Yeah, OK. The, the right. army is barely coping there at the moment. You you okay. take these out and it will, they, will, they will be packing up just as the storm surge is at its worst in that area. So what we will see is the army being withdrawn just when they're needed most. And the, 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 the tide surge is due in London if it's going to happen in the next two hours, is this it? So uh, 90 minutes, I understand. In 90 that. minutes and the troops take approximately one hour. Well, if it happens. If it happens. So if you redeploy those troops, Minister, they'll be arriving in London just as they're needed. And, Mr. I should remind you, of course, every minute you discuss mm, here, yeah. of course, your options narrow. Those troops, mm. if they're going to be moved, they need to okay. get on their way. My opinion we is that so we've got to, I think we've got to move the, move the army to, to London. London. And just to make, make it clear, you, you are obviously prepared to allow, possibly, a certain number of people to die on the East Coast. I'm not prepared to allow anyone to die. What I have to do is make a very tough decision on very cold uh, facts. The facts are that there is, London is in, in imminent danger. Mass destruction and loss of life is a strong likelihood. And we've got a situation that is very, very challenging in East Anglia, but it's one that's been dealt with. I know that taking the troops out of that area will make life much more difficult up there and could lead to the loss of life. But I'm now calculating that there will be a much greater loss of life if I fail to make that decision. So, Ministers, I think we have your decision and you have decided to send the troops to London. And, Ministers, your decision will be enacted. Sending the army to London is the right option. Finite resources need to be used effectively to minimise the loss of life. Although the people on the east coast are in the most immediate danger, the threat to the capital is so severe, the government can't afford to leave it unprotected. The ministers have made their first correct decision. The storm surge is advancing towards the capital. Only the Thames barrier stands between London and the flood. But flood defences are being overwhelmed all along the coastline. There is no guarantee the barrier will hold. I'm here at the Thames Barrier Park, where the last of these huge gates, designed to protect the capital from flooding, has just been raised into position. Now, in the past few moments, a source in the control room here has admitted to me that they're extremely worried that a massive tidal surge is heading towards London and that even with this barrier closed, large parts of the capital could soon end up underwater. Now, this source, an experienced engineer who's worked here for a number of years, said that he can't understand why the public hasn't been warned and given a chance to get out. Uh, ministers, I also have Thames Barrier Control uh, back on the line for you again. The surge tide has now reached Harwich, where a record high water mark of 4.1 metres has just been confirmed. 
At current levels, we expect the Thames barrier to hold, but the barking tidal gate just before this barrier could easily breach under these conditions. So we recommend that you take the necessary precautions for flooding in East London from Barking to Canary Wharf. Uh, to recap, the surge tide is nearly at the Thames uh, estuary uh, and it is now certain it will reach London. And ministers, your choices are really these. Would you like to evacuate everybody, those at greatest risk, or no one? Advise people to stay put where they are. Staying put where you are is not an option. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I personally scenario. agree. I mean, I think in the in the areas that are under immediate threat, we should have we should notify and evacuate. Do we, what is the evacuation procedure for everyone? I mean, is that going to work smoothly? Uh, or, I well, doubt very no, much that right. um, any mass evacuation could ever be described as a smooth operation. But I mean, we're talking with everybody, approximately 160,000 people uh, in that affected area. Um, the decision to evacuate those at greatest risk would basically be those that live. Um, uh, where the water might be three metres, up to three metres deep. Uh, it would be approximately 25,000 people, 30,000 people, something like that, and includes the sick and the ill in those areas. What you're saying, we'd be taking out those individuals for a variety of people, are particularly vulnerable mm. as individuals. But in addition to that, we'd be taking out all those people who are most vulnerable because of their proximity. Exactly, yeah? Mr. I mean, the more... Uh, you restrict the number of people that you're going to evacuate, the, the more I would suggest uh, effective that evacuation will be. Communications, can we, can we actually get that message out to people and tell them that there is a potential? Well, just imagine what it would sound like, Minister. You know, if someone goes forward and, and may, or we issue a statement saying, we're taking out the most vulnerable, mm. but everyone else stay because you're completely safe and we'll get to you later on. I mean, what would you do? You'd, you'd just be up and off, wouldn't you? Sounds laughable. We're, we're up against a time pressure, it seems to be, Minister. There's a very easy message. If we look at that area that is going to be at risk and we just tell everybody to move out to the high ground and we, we, don't, we don't try and have a staged process, I don't think we've got the time for it. Mm. What I want to do is to save as many, like everyone, as many lives as possible. I believe there's a danger that ultimately we could be putting more lives at risk by actually evacuating everybody at the same time. I think the danger that we've got is if we go to evacuate the vulnerable in this area and we leave the other people there, before we know it we've got another situation developing mm. somewhere else. My position is that uh, we should evacuate the most vulnerable people uh, in the first instance. Minister, right. I can see you've uh, come to a decision, and, you, like and you're, you've got me, your head in your it's hands. It's me, wretchedly. Um, well, no, you've got to decide. I, so absolutely. You've got two other ministers with different points of absolutely. view. Absolutely. I absolutely have. Um, and my opinion is that we need now to tell everyone and we need to evacuate everyone. Yeah. Panic's going to happen, therefore, if we're... Uh, listen, you don't have very yes, long. Evacuating those at greatest risk. I've changed my mind. Um, evacuating those at greatest risk. I'm getting risk. confused as to where you are. <laughs> I'm not getting confused. I'm getting confused over what the options mean. I think okay. everyone should get okay. out. Right. L let's be clear on this. It's either a partial evacuation of those who are uh, at greatest risk or it's everyone. Partial evacuation. I think we can do that more effectively. What about the rest? Um, I think the rest are, the rest are less, less vulnerable, but I think it's a problem. I'd like to evacuate everybody, but we don't have that. Minister, uh, you won't come back to me Swiss. when we're short of resources in day two, day three, day this four, and problem. we've got all these people trapped there. We've got a development, we've got a situation developing all over London. Panic's going panic's to set in, and I it's think we need to It's going to set in if the media tell them first. People are going to see you removing only the vulnerable people, and we're not going to be able to go back on this. I think you're going to make a decision here that you're going to live to regret. All right, Ministers, uh, let's be clear, and then I'll pass on your decision. Minister? Uh, those are the greatest risk, at greatest risk. Those are the greatest risk. Evacuate all. I don't have unanimity on this one, uh, but, Ministers, you have taken your decision, and it will be enacted. You have been overruled. <laughs> Evacuating those at greatest risk is the correct choice. The Thames region has a flood warning system. There is a detailed plan of those at risk. Removing the vulnerable minimises the loss of life. Across Britain, the storm is raging. Heavy rainfall has caused flooding in Worcester. Near the village of Heldham, the army is trying to prevent the River Severn from bursting its banks. If it breaches, a chemical factory will flood causing widespread pollution. Now, Ministers, I'd like to take you to Worcestershire uh, and the Royal Engineers. 
The River Severn here is close to bursting its banks. We've been reinforcing the most vulnerable sections with sandbags, which are just about holding. There is a danger that if the water level continues to rise, we'll have a major breach on our hands. My wrecking section have reported a disused chemical factory on the industrial estate near here. If that gets flooded, we're facing a major contamination of the flooded area. We could try using explosive charges to blow a hole in the river defences upstream. This would take the pressure off, but would mean flooding a village and a fair bit of farmland. Uh, ministers, a uh, difficult line coming from Worcester there. Um, clearly what the engineers have been trying to do is prevent the River Severn from bursting its banks and flooding industrial estates. So, essentially, what you are being asked here is this. Would you sacrifice a small village in order to prevent widespread contamination? And you've got a choice here, ministers. Flood the village and the farmland or allow the chemical factory to flood. I think we need to know the impact of the chemical factory flooding. Yeah, can somebody help us on that? Uh, I'm trying to get information from them on the ground on the army net at the moment, oh. ministers. It's an industrial site, it's got industrial waste. There are a lot of old containers. Uh, they are testing at the moment, but they think it's probably arsenic and cyanide. Well, right. that's, gonna, that's a huge um, disaster if that gets into the water table. Uh, there's also a, an input to the drinking water uh, factory just downstream of this. So we, we have a potential problem that if that gets into there, you've then got to clean up got all the... Got to flood the village well. as far as I'm concerned. The long-term problem with the chemical contamination outweighs the short-term, medium-term damage to the village, and I think the villagers would understand that. And what are the consequences of flooding the village? The problem is, evacuation may be difficult. The police are, of course, at full stretch, uh, ambulance crews, fire crews and so on, exactly the same people you'd be using in an evacuation. And, of course, we know that the army is also fully engaged with this sandbagging and other operations. Ministers, I'm very concerned about how this will look. I think having this place described as a village, you may be thinking Cotswolds. This is a very, very poor area. And they're low-lying buildings. There's a lot of caravans, a lot of makeshift accommodation there as well. You've already abandoned the East Coast for very good reasons. I understand that. But it looks as though, in this crisis, you don't give a damn about the poor people or about the poor people's houses. We're protecting industry and big business. Well, yeah, that's what that's, it looks that's, like. That's what that's it could what look looking, like. That's what it could look like, and there's a real I, I, danger. I don't, don't, I don't think it does look like that, because, I mean, if you if you particularly got chemicals that are going to affect drinking water, you know, that... You, I don't think there's, a dis I don't think there's any just, issue here. I think I we think have to flood the village. People, but it's a red herring. It's I think, totally uh, relevant. Yeah, I, I, I don't think... the right decision for the right reason. I don't really care about the publicity side of it. I think we should flood the village and we should protect the people and the environment, drinking water and everything. I'm OK, so we've made that Need decision and we live with yeah. it. All right, Ministers, um, it seems to me you are unanimous on this. Yes. And uh, your decision will be enacted. The Ministers have made the right decision. Flooding the village will affect the homes of some 200 people. The pollution from the chemical factory would affect thousands. Experts estimate the river system could take 10 years to recover. The ministers have made their third correct decision. The storm surge has hit the Thames estuary and shows no sign of abating. An alarming taste of what's to come in East London. Flood defences have breached at two points downstream from the Thames barrier at Thames Mead. The homes of 45,000 local people are already under three feet of water and levels are steadily rising. One of London's main sewage works has been completely swamped and a mixture of water and effluent is pouring into the former floodplain. The emergency services are at full stretch dealing with what is clearly a very dangerous situation. Uh, ministers, I'm hearing this as, as you are. The surge tide has unexpectedly breached river defences at Thamesmead, a relatively new suburb of London built on reclaimed floodplain on the south side of the Thames. Now, the governor of Belmarsh, a Category A prison situated uh, near the breach at Thamesmead, needs to speak to you urgently. We've got water rushing into the area around the prison and it's already knee-deep. We're on a skeleton staff here at the moment because many of my officers have left to help their families get away from the area. We need to evacuate immediately, but we haven't got nearly enough staff to do it safely or anywhere to take the prisoners at such short notice. Ministers, this very difficult situation. Flood water has shorted the electricity supply at the prison. Flood water, I'm hearing, is gushing in through the main gate. And there are not enough prison officers to evacuate prisoners safely. Uh, water levels are rising fast. Uh, you have to decide this. Are you going to suggest the governor risks 
an understaffed evacuation or do you leave the prisoners locked inside their cells? OK. Now, let me just find out what's, uh, what a prison looked like, because it might have a Victorian thing with many floors. It might not, Minister. A... The basic oh. geography is that you've got the Category A um, prisoners are in uh, a block which has got only two floors. But don't be under any uh, you know, illusion about the consequences of, of what's being decided here. When it says here you risk evacuation, what's really being said is let these people go. That's, right. what, that's what I thought it meant. All right. Yeah. OK. We uh, can't... Uh, um, can I... Lock, uh, leaving them locked in their cells with a flood water, is just uh, giving them a death sentence, is it? Depends how high the water gets, Minister, but right. it's certainly rising very quickly. That's what the Governor's telling us. Right. OK. I think we can't... I don't think we can leave people to drown, no matter how dangerous the criminals they are. Just to update you again, it's my duty to tell you, obviously, all these facts. We're talking Category A prisoners, in case you misunderstand what that means. We're talking rapists, murderers, armed robbers. People are in there on life sentences for a good reason. It also includes, of course, terrorists, including the 13 or so uh, terrorists detained under the anti-terrorism legislation, certified by your colleague, the Home Secretary, as being so dangerous, of course, they are held there without charge. It's interesting that we haven't got uh, capital punishment in this country. And from what I'm being told, if we were to leave the prisoners in their cells, Effectively, we'll be killing them. That's There's right. a high probability right. that we'll be killing them. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is I think a very that's difficult decision. decision. Yeah, I think very that's the difficult. We have to, I don't think we should let any human being mm. drown. Mm. I don't think that's right. I think they could they could be rounded up and, and caught. They're not tagged or anything like that. We can't track them. Um, they're going to be pretty much stranded anyway. We're going to have all sorts of different bigger scale problems, aren't we? We've got a PR problem. Whatever way we go, Forget, we take them out. Yeah. Would, would you agree? Yeah. Okay. I think you've got a huge PR problem one way, Minister, if you're looking at what the general public will think about it. I mean, most of the papers, if you look at it, if they divide the public up that way, 20 million readers, most of them would absolutely be appalled if you let these people out. There is a resource issue as well, of course, Minister, as you mentioned about that uh, they can be rounded up. This isn't really the possibility that uh, springs to mind because, of course, the police are absolutely overstretched helping the civilian population. If you want them to now start concentrating on prisoners, you probably will lose lives amongst the civilian in, population. In time, in time, I mean, I'm not saying... Well, it's taken next... years of investigation to catch some of these people, of course, so and they're... many people died in the process. But we actually know that they're guilty of their crimes, etc. We've got et people on remand in there as well, I assume. The, the, the remand block is elsewhere, Ministers, but, of course, you do have the people I mentioned detained under the Anti-Terrorism Act, not charged, but, as not I say, charged. considered by your colleagues so dangerous that they have to be detained. People will die, almost certainly, if you release these people... Uh, it's obviously a decision for yourselves, but there are consequences uh, that are very heavy for both sides. And, of course, the people who that, die, if you release them, will undoubtedly be innocent people. That's the kicker for me. I, I think my first reaction was to um, look at letting them, letting them out so they don't drown. My, my, on further, I'm, I'm, I'm for locking them up. I'm for leaving them locked up and taking the risk with these people. They could do a lot more. Um, the terrorists, the Category A prisoners, some of who are murderers, have taken innocent lives already. Um, I think that the long-term consequences are, are going to haunt us if we let them out. I don't think we can leave people, people there to die. I, I agree, but I think we've got to make a decision one way or the other. Just because they're criminals? Yes. We're because now they're being Category told, A. We're now being told that innocent people will lose their lives if we allow these prisoners to go. May lose their lives. No, I, I think we were told categorically that people would well, die. Well, let me... Let me um, quantify that if I can. Obviously, I can't predict the future, Minister, but these people, some of whom, uh, their past record would certainly suggest that uh, once released, uh, they will kill, mm. rape, uh, act against children and perhaps commit terrorist offences. That's, that's the obvious information, okay. Minister. So that, that is new within this particular uh, developing crisis for me. Uh, the other consideration is that there is no certainty, absolute certainty, that the water will continue rising and therefore those left behind in the cells would die. So, you know, there's no certainty there. I'm really taken by the information that I've received about the, the likelihood of these Category A, uh, a prisoners offending and killing, raping, uh, abusing children. And I'm bound to say, in this impossible situation that we're placed in, I'm moving very much to leaving the prisoners there. 
because of the consequences to wider society should we decide to let them out. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you entirely. It's the consequences of letting them go are for innocent people are greater than the consequences for those people, some of whom haven't been proven to be guilty, but a whole bunch of them have been proven to be guilty. Uh, there's a chance that they might die. I think uh, I'd come down on the side of leaving the prisoners locked inside. There's no certainty that those people are out and, and re-offend. Mm. They, we're in an emergency situation, the whole country's uh, in an course. emergency yeah. situation. And this is not a decision I'm easy with. I don't like the decision I'm making. You know, I, I, I don't believe in capital punishment. These people have not been sentenced to death, and I don't think it's any part of my dis job to sentence them to death. However, I have to look at the greatest good, and I think the greatest good actually serves with leaving these people in, hoping that the, they, they ex uh, escape the worst of the flooding and therefore not being allowed onto, into wider society to reoffend, Mr. I, I, I didn't come give you any advice well, because you, you all seemed at the start to have seen the nature of the problem. You are, we're, we're going to have s probably six metres of water in that area, so we're certainly going to drown 24 people on the bottom floor. We may well drown 48 people, people who may or may not have been guilty of particular crimes, some of which have been uh, held under the anti-terrorism, anti but all the crimes for which they have been held do not attract the death penalty because we don't have the death penalty. I think pe uh, perhaps some of them should attract the death penalty. That is a question for Parliament, Ministers, uh, and I, I have to say I am horrified about the way this discussion is going. Well, now, you've just introduced, with all due respect, a new element. You talked uh, that some people absolutely, certainly will die. That wasn't part of the original scenario. I, I don't think we can say that, uh, Ministers. I mean, the, the people on the ground, of course, the, the, the Governor is saying the water's rushing in, and there is a, quite a probability of what Tim has just described, but it simply can't be said it is certain, although it is quite likely. You can't leave people to drown behind locked doors. Ministers, you seem to be swaying with whatever uh, advice you get. The last person that talks to you, you know, you go in that direction. Um, all the time, the surge is moving up closer to London. You've got to decide, Ministers. Yeah. I want to leave them locked up. I'll leave them locked up. Let them out. OK. You can't let people drown. No, but I, I'm banking on that uh, hole in the defence has been uh, fixed in time to prevent the loss of life. If, if you make this decision, Ministers, I will want the Secretariat to record it, record my advice, record the dissenting view for the subsequent criminal trial. What's uh, criminal trial? Well, this is... Because you've chosen to leave people to die. OK, but uh, are you yeah, saying then we will now be subject... Should those people die, we'll be subject to some criminal procedure as ministers? It's a possibility, Minister, yeah, of Ministers, course. they may die or they may not, but it's a decision that you have to take. You are getting advice from your advisers. Are you wavering again? No. No. No, I'll have to defend my, uh, my decision in court. And you're prepared to do that? I'm prepared to do that. Because only a few minutes ago, of course, you felt it was morally the wrong thing to do. Absolutely, but then the consequences of these people being allowed into wider society was drawn to my attention. That information didn't inform my original reaction. Mine was a, a very straightforward, humane reaction. But then the consequence of that humane decision on innocence out there was brought home to me. And as a result of that, I've now changed my position and I'm ready to defend my position in court if that situation arises. Let's get, uh, let's get a decision here on Belmarsh. Evacuate. Leave them inside. Leave the prisoners. Time is up here. Uh, we don't have unanimity. But your decision that you've taken will be enacted. Leaving the prisoners locked in their cells is the wrong course of action. Article 2 of the Human Rights Act of 1998 states that everyone has a right to life and shall be protected by law. Risking the prisoners' lives is an act of criminal negligence. Under British law, the ministers could be charged with manslaughter. Downstream from Belmarsh, the east end of London has started to flood. 
We're getting reports that the surge tide has breached defences on the River Thames and that water is flooding into parts of East London. Now, I think we can bring you some pictures of that. These were the latest pictures taken just a few minutes ago from a helicopter over the area. Now, you can see that the airport is flooded and it looks like planes there surrounded by water. Um, well, I'm sorry we seem to have lost those pictures, but from what we did see, this clearly is an extremely serious situation. To add to the crisis in the East End, a liquid petroleum gas storage plant is now under several feet of water. Emergency services are at the scene. I have the Metropolitan Police on the video link. I'd like to connect you to them. Water levels at this LPG storage plant have risen rapidly, and there are already concerns that some of the tanks have floated free from their concrete cradles. Unless we can stop the water levels rising further, there could be a huge explosion. Uh, ministers, to clarify, I'm getting this like you are, that the police are concerned the tanks will float higher, straining their pipes further, leading to a major gas leak and potentially an explosion. And one solution is to try and find an outlet for all this water that's uh, flowing up the Thames. The Thames barrier, as you've heard, is currently closed, but you could choose to open it and prevent water levels from rising higher. Ministers, your decision is this. Do you order the Thames barrier to remain closed or do you open it? Where are these uh, containers floating and how big are they? And what kind of damage are they going to do? Who would be able to advise us on, on that? Well, I'm still getting information in on it, Minister. It, it's a big LPG storage area and, as I understand it, uh, large quantities. What we don't quite know is, is, is what the effect will be. I mean, they'll certainly go up, there'll be an ignition at some stage. If it, if it happens early, there is uh, an awful possibility that, that you get a torching effect from the propane. It heats up the big storage thing and you get a really big bang with a mushroom cloud. Uh, it's a fireball. I got the figures uh, from my guys that say fireball's about 500 metres in diameter and totally lethal within that. 50% mm. lethality out to 1,200 metres. Uh, I mean, and it, everything burns. That, if you like, is one possibility. The other is that they would fracture and the gas mixes with the air. air. We get a fuel-air explosive cloud. In military terms, the nearest thing you can get to a, a nuclear explosion. You get secondary-degree secondary degree burns to exposed skin out to about a mile. You, you, we've got uh, tower blocks nearby. It, it, it's a big disaster. So it creates an aerosol effect. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, the wind may disperse it. I, I just right. can't and predict. And the weather this... is bad. Is it? It's raining. Is that going to? Is the rain going to have an effect on the? On the if gas? it doesn't ignite too quickly, I mean, the longer it is before it ignites, it'll... the better. But of course, it'll also ignite any uh, floating petrol, of which there's lots around now that okay. the petrol station. That sounds dreadful. Started. Charles, uh, what are the consequences to opening the barrier? Because, in light of what uh, Tim just said to us, you think that's the way to go. But what are the consequences at this point in this emergency? Well, one of the consequences, ministers, would be to alleviate the problem that Tim's described. Uh, you could get the water down. They would have to open all the barrier gates, um, probably for about 30 minutes, something like that would be sufficient. But the effect of that uh, upstream uh, would be uh, quite severe, to say the least. Um, effectively, you're looking at a four-metre wave being created, which would then travel upstream towards the city. You've got problems, of course, with the uh, tube. There's a tube station, of course, in um, uh, Greenwich that uh, would be affected, so you'd have problems with the tube at some point. And, of course, people in those areas haven't been prepared. Mm. Would we have time to evacuate the area? Time. That's going to be affected no, by the flood. It's really short. Uh, we can't say when it'll rupture, uh, but uh, mm. I, I think it's going to be within the next 20 minutes or so. I don't think we can flood the city of London. So, Tim, can you just go through the consequences again of the gas exposure? Well, I wish I, wish I knew, Minister, mm. is the answer. Um, if, if it ignites where it is in these vast storage things, mm. you get a really big fireball uh, because you've boiled the liquid gas before it explodes. You also get shrapnel, of course, from all the, the exploding tanks that mm. they're in. Mm. If it escapes, you've still got a problem. As long as it remains concentrated, it mixes with the air. And you get another fireball, uh, which, which has uh, a, a big burning effect. You get secondary burning from all the petrol stations. We've seen it in previous floods that actually quite often fire Become, becomes the bigger problem. Mm. And, of course, the emergency services are all tied up with the flood at the moment. Mm. And if that explosion takes place, we're talking about destruction, of, certainly of property, but also of uh, life? Yeah, two tower blocks, I think, yeah. are almost certain to go. And if we flood part of London, 
we're talking here about a lot of dislocation, uh, inconvenience, disruption to, to life, but not loss of life or destruction of property. Not really, Minister. You uh, will get um, almost certainly uh, damage to property. And yeah. you'll, you'll probably get loss of life as well if you open the barrier, of course. Water flooding down will have effects. Um, because we've not been able to evacuate or prepare people. Of course, on, that side, on that so side. So we're in, you know, we're going to have a loss of life, whatever of option some, we take. It's likely. Some, yes, and this may go at any moment, so, so you need I'm a quick keep the barrier shut. whatever it is. I, I think we have to keep the barrier shut. We have to protect central London. We have to protect the infrastructure. Okay. Presumably people are being evacuated right now from that area anyway, uh, or people are leaving. I mean, they'd be stupid. Only the vulnerable. Uh, well, no, the vulnerable are being evacuated from those particular areas, but be, be, beyond that, people are going to be leaving London. Um, I presume that information is, is going to be coming in at some stage. I'm sorry, I've got to interrupt you. Um, I'll take you immediately back to Worcester and the Royal Engineers who need to talk to you urgently. They've got a problem. There are problems with the evacuation of the village. A number of people are refusing to leave their homes and possessions behind. Water levels are rising fast, and I remain concerned about the risk to the chemical factory. Developments in Worcester have raised the stakes significantly. The army doesn't have the authority to forcibly remove people. Ministers, they need a very quick decision on, from you. They are having problems evacuating those people from the village. And, and the question for you is this. Do you flood the village with some inhabitants still in their houses or do you abort this deliberate flooding operation and allow the chemical factory to flood? I, I'm still down for, for flooding the village. I think Me we too. have to. I think we have to flood the village. Um, the risk to the drinking they've water? been told, these people have been told the situation. They've got to be out there. It's not as if somebody's knocked on the door and said, leave, it's the army. They know there's a problem coming. Uh, I think... Flood the village. Yeah. Yeah. It's a quick decision. I'm, I'm delighted you're, you're taking a quick decision. But um, you, are, you do realise that there are still people in this village. Absolutely. Absolutely. People have had uh, ample time to move. They've been encouraged to move, but they're resisting. They've probably worked out that they can go to their upper floors and they will be OK. I I'm sorry about that, but the risk of not doing that are far too great. This is the problem here is this is intentional flooding. This isn't we're going to lead them, we're going to, you know, bring the army in from the east coast and maybe some people will die. You flood this village, you've got people still in there and people will die. I think it's in this emergency decision, around the country, people are dying. If we don't take the option that we, we, we decided we'd take previously, the risk to life is significantly greater. All right, Minister, Minister what's yeah, your view? I mean, I, I, I go with my original decision on this, is that the reason that we were um, flooding the village in the first place was because there was a potential um, issue of um, drinking water just, being contaminated. This is an environmental disaster we're talking about. It's not a human disaster at the moment. I mean, you know people will die if you flood that village. No, we don't know that. You do know you've got seven well, or eight people, they the can't get the out of their houses. Two, well, they say it's virtually certain two or three will because the wall of water is apparently now. We've left the decision so late that the water will be quite a large wave, I understand. I, I can confirm that from the army net, ministers. So uh, if you authorise me, the army will blow this and uh, you will have authorised them to effectively flood the village and kill people. It's another one of these really awful decisions. I still think we've got to avoid poisoning... I mean, we could be killing thousands if we let the chemical factory uh, go up. I mean, that Absolutely. chemical factory is lethal if, if the contents are actually what they say they are. Is there any proof of, of the content? Yeah, no, we are certain of the contents. Certain of the contents uh, you're, right, you're right about contamination, but of course it won't kill people uh, yes, necessarily. It will, it's but, it's but, persistent, isn't it? Uh, but it will be very expensive to clean it up. We'll have to supply bottled water. We'll have to sort out the, uh, the filtration place. But we're not going to pipe poisoned water to people, I trust. That would uh, be very... So there's the, the option of uh, leaving the chemical dump to go up will not involve killing of people. Of course, Minister, you can't guarantee long-term no, consequences, think... but there won't be yeah. any... There's no immediate threat to life. Yeah, and we can clear it up. OK. In light of the fact that people are not leaving the village and we know we're going to kill, we've been told we're going to kill people, uh, I'm not prepared to do that. These people are wholly innocent. They're unlike the people at Belmarsh that uh, I took the decision to leave in their cells, and I'm not prepared to kill these innocent people. I don't want to kill the people. I won't kill... No, I don't want to... I won't kill the people. And I'd go through the aggravation, the cost of cleaning up the environmental impact of the decision I'm making. This is a huge environmental impact, isn't it? And I thought it would be actually lethal. Oh, no, it, it is a huge... It's, be, it's, be under no um, uh, illusions, it is a huge environmental yeah. impact. You've got that immediately, ministers. But, but in the end, I mean, we, 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 we take measures to ensure people don't die of it, but the, the economic consequences, of course, are enormous, and it would take a long time to clear it up.
And I think we, so nobody, we need so to for pay sure, that. nobody's going to die in that situation, or as far as you can advise us, it's not an immediate. For sure, leave. Minister, we're all going to die. We're only <laughs> talking about when. That's very true. That's very true. Okay. I think very the villagers too. have been given an opportunity to evacuate. They're very unlike the prisoners who can't evacuate. Um, if people choose to stay there, that's their choice. We need to flood the, vid fill it, flood the I'm village. I'm not prepared to kill people for money. <clears throat> I'm still very, very concerned about the arsenic. I think arsenic can be lethal in very, very small doses, and I, I'm not sure that we're getting the correct kind of information. I still want to flood the, I still want to flood the village. That's, that's Minister, hideous. Um, your fellow minister here is having a moment of conscience. Mm -hmm. He's not prepared to lose lives for money. Mm -hmm. You I'm, are. I'm not prepared to lose lives for money, but what, I, what, I, what we are doing is we're giving people adequate warning, we're warning them of the risks, we're informing them what we're going to do. If they, stay, if they choose to stay, we can't physically remove people. We're a democratic society. If people choose to stay with their belongings, that's, that's their choice. No, excuse me. I, I heard information a few moments ago that people would absolutely die uh, if we left them in the village. Of the uh, police command on the yeah. ground minister that it's quite it's likely, in fact, his words are very probable. They're all opinions. It's almost certain. Uh, but we okay. don't know the yeah, it's uh, almost certain. You, it's probability. Okay, possibility. I'll stay with my new decision that I'm not prepared to sacrifice their lives for money and inconvenience. I'll stay with the decision of flooding the village. Uh, of flooding the village as well, because I think the implications of that kind of chemical disaster in the in the groundwater are, are long term and much more substantial than uh, we're uh, getting Minister, information. Uh, you know, if lives are lost here, it would be very helpful to have a, a unanimous decision very quickly. Can you persuade your fellow minister, who feels so strongly about this? I understand entirely your p position on on losing life, and I think that uh, it's not a guarantee. I think the advice we're getting is very mixed um, in terms of the actual guarantee, if you like, of losing life or otherwise. And I think, for example, a, a catastrophic release of arsenic and these chemical compounds could cause us huge problems down the road and could kill hundreds and hundreds of people as a result, but slowly. So we've got the, I think we've got to weigh up the possibility of some people dying now <coughs> with the possibility of a lot of people dying later. And, and I, ha I, I agree with you, I wouldn't, if it was just money, if it was just money, I would absolutely come down on the side of let the chemical factory uh, and we'll spend Minister, money on Minister, can it. we get unanimity on this? Uh, uh, you know, because, Jason, uh, I, I agree with the, the, uh, the point you're making, very good point. If I believe, and if we'd been led to believe that w there would be a loss of life down the road if I took the decision not to blow up, uh, not, not to flood the village, I would actually do that because clearly you'd be saving far greater numbers of life down the road, OK? The loss of life is a key thing for me. Innocent lives, mm. and because I don't believe, because I've not been told that others will lose their lives down the road, uh, I'm firm in my fine, decision, but I respect the point you're making. Sure. So, final decision, Minister. Flood the village. Flood the village? Flood the village. Can we cha change no. your... No. 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 We don't have unanimity. <laughs> so, Ministers, you have taken that decision and it will be enacted. In the light of the change in circumstances, flooding the village is the wrong decision. Saving life is the top priority. The chemical pollution will cost millions to clean up, but it will not cost lives. This is their third incorrect decision. Now, uh, let's go back to that developing situation in London. Hundreds of feared dead as water levels in East London continue to rise. Police say the speed and the force of the flood water has taken everybody by surprise. There's panic and confusion in the ongoing evacuation. With the majority of roads in the affected areas impassable, emergency services have been unable to reach many people in the worst affected zones. It could be weeks before water levels subside and the true scale of this disaster can be calculated. London is on the brink of unprecedented disaster. Roads are jammed. A liquid petroleum gas plant is moments away from explosion. Only by lowering the Thames barrier can the crisis be averted. But what are the cost? Well, we've got water still rising. It looks as like if we're arriving at a critical point. And you ministers, of course, still have to take uh, the key decision about the, the barrier. Uh, do you want the barrier to remain closed, to remain shut? Or do you want to open the barrier in order to prevent an explosion? 
We're we killing people That's... with both decisions. But are a... we? Are we, though, Jason? Well, yes. Uh, 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 advice on if we, f if we open the Thames barrier and it, it floods, yeah. the, people the, the will die. The report I'm getting from, from the engineers on the ground there is that uh, this is very close to happening, ministers. Uh, if, if you don't make a decision soon, okay. you won't have a decision. I think we have a right to know, you know, the issue here is minimise the loss of life. That's the issue here, yeah? Now, if we go with uh, option one, what is the likely number of people who would lose their life? To the best guess, yeah? If you go with option two, what is the likely number? Best guess. Option two, certainly. I because think we are killing people. But the, whatever decision we make, there will be a loss of life. But and we so will I, 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 that. I can't make this easy for you. I, I have no idea of how this gas is going to be released, how it's going to go up. At uh, the worst case, you know, maybe we're going to lose the residents of two tower blocks. That's um, about 500 people, according to local police. Uh, right. Uh, maybe we're going to start a train of fires which yeah. will have deaths and consequences beyond. I, I can't give you the okay. numbers. OK, but and opening the floodgates? If you open up the barrier, Minister, what was the point of building it in the first place? You are protecting an infinite uh, amount of real estate, and I'm talking not just people's houses, I'm talking about the commercial centre of our country, and I'm also talking about the amount of uh, lives that will be lost, probably hundreds also. Right, OK. Yeah. I think you need to keep it closed. It. I, I, think, I don't think we've got... Uh, it's, Awful, but again, I think we've got to keep the, the barrier closed. That would be my opinion because we've got to restrict the problem to the area that we're dealing with as well. We're going to spread the problem. We've already got we've massive already, flood problems. We're already we haven't got enough people on the on the ground helping people out, and we're already thin on the ground with emergency services. So I don't mean to be um, insulting here, but would your decisions be any different if this wasn't 500 people in tower blocks? You know, if this absolutely was, not. That's if, outrageous suggestion, Amanda. Again and again, ministers, you have made decisions which went against the poor people in this country. I mean, I'm afraid that is the way this crisis has unfolded. You abandoned people on the East Coast. You didn't care about the people in the village. I mean, that is the no, pattern we care here. Passionately You're the about the people in the who village. think the poor people don't care about their homes or their lives, it appears. Well, that's one way of spinning it, but that's not the decisions well, that we're that's making. that's one of the ways, Ministers, that the media will spin it. Again and again, then you have opted in favour of property and wealth and against poor people. No, we haven't. We have never weighed up property and wealth. What we've weighed up is death and destruction. That's every single decision That's we've made. Saving certain numbers of lives. It's saving that we can lives save. and certainty. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's I've never one made a decision based on um, factor money. that we've kept in mind throughout is that minimise the loss of life, and everything Absolutely. we've done has been calculated to do that. Even if we've made a wrong decision, that has been our intention. The idea, which I find obnoxious, that we we are motivated in any way by sacrificing the poor to save the better off, is outrageous. It's, outrageous. it's outrageous. monstrous suggestion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, Minister, it's a monstrous suggestion, whatever. The headlines at the moment, you've got flood. Every single news bulletin, it's flood, it's death. Do you want fire on top of that? I think within the options that we have available, we haven't got a choice. Yeah, I think there's very limited choice. Yeah. All right, we've made a decision. We're going to keep them closed. Afraid so. Yeah. So, Ministers, you're at, you know, you clearly know what a big decision you are taking here. And you're absolutely certain you've taken the right decision? Yes. I have to ask you this because, you know, these are very, very big issues you're dealing with. I'm, I'm never certain I've made the right decision, but I think in the circumstances we've got to make the best decision we can. And what, I have no idea whether the decision sure. we've taken is the right one, but I think it is the right one. Minister? Yeah, keep the barrier shut. I think that, um, you know, at the moment we're, we're battling with ensuring that we're saving the City of London from massive flood. I don't think we can go and open the barrier. Minister? Fine balance, but I think we've got to keep the barrier closed. All right, Ministers, on that you have been unanimous, and I will ensure that decision is enacted. Is there, any, is there any more information on um, the evacuation or PR? Is there any coverage we're getting from... What is the media saying? We haven't actually we've had a bit of a media blackout here. No, we anything? haven't, Minister. It's been, you know, 24-hour news bulletins. It's, it's right. carrying... I mean, there obviously a lot of people have drowned on the East Coast. We're still not um, certain there's a total number there. But, you know, at the moment, people are most occupied with the flooding. And that's what's running everywhere. Your decisions, decisions as yet, haven't really become clear. Go, we've evacuated all the emergency services from the area of the LPG store. They think it's going to go any moment, ministers. Okay.
Just one moment, Minister. I can tell you there's been uh, an explosion in London, and I'd like to connect you immediately to uh, the news bulletins. Well, since we've been on air, news has started coming in of a massive explosion in East London. Now, the details are still very sketchy, but the blast does seem to have been centred on an industrial estate close to the airport in Docklands. Let's see if we can get those uh, pictures right now. And, and you can see the plumes of, of, of fire flames going up into, into the sky. It's clearly a major blast. First reports from the scene say that a large area, and some of it apparently residential, was engulfed by the fireball. We'll bring you more pictures from the scene as soon as we get them, but let me just repeat that uh, breaking news. There's been a massive explosion in East London. A large area, some of it residential, has been badly damaged by a giant fireball. And now this uh, just coming in, London's hospitals have been put on full alert to deal with casualties from the blast. Off-duty doctors and nurses are being asked to report for work. This is now a major incident. Ministers, you have actually taken your last decision and you're no longer running the country during this crisis. In spite of the devastating consequences, keeping the barrier shut was the correct response. Had they chosen to lower it, the flash flood would have proved far more devastating, paralyzing the underground and causing an estimable loss of life in Canary Wharf and Greenwich. The damage to the British economy would run into billions. Over the course of the national emergency, the ministers made four correct and three incorrect decisions. At the village in Worcester, environmental concerns were valued over human life. In the case of the prisoners at Belmarsh, the minister's actions were criminal. Keeping the Thames barrier raised resulted in the destruction of an area of East London and significant loss of life. However, the ministers preserved the capital from a far greater catastrophe. Ministers, throughout this crisis, uh, you've had the benefit of calling upon advisers and hearing from them. But apart from uh, giving you advice and information, of course, they've also been ob observing and assessing how you performed as ministers. Uh, and I'd like to bring in Sir Tim Garden, who was your advisor on military matters. How did they do? Ministers, you were decisive. You were ruthless at times. I think we'd probably say too ruthless on occasions. But I think from a an advisor's point of view, it was disconcerting that you seemed to come to a decision instantly, and then you asked for some advice about the facts, and then you came to perhaps different decisions. It might have been better to keep your powder dry until you'd heard everything. Well, Minister, you had a very healthy respect for the media and the way that it would help you through this crisis and the way your actions were being played out. I thought you took very humane decisions a lot of the time, not that that necessarily meant that they were the right ones. Um, you didn't care enough about people to tell the British public the truth when you knew the impending um, threat of the flood. And unfortunately, you cared too much about the Brit British public when it came to Belmarsh and, and leaving those prisoners in. And I can assure you, Minister, you would have had your day in court. And finally, Ministers, with the barrier decision, your decision was overwhelmingly the correct one. That barrier was built for a purpose. You couldn't quantify the loss of life, whichever decision you took, but what you could quantify was the medium and long-term risks to the future of the capital and therefore to the rest of the country, and your decision was correct. Ministers, during the time that you were in charge of this country, you took a series of truly awesome decisions. I mean, you had to decide who would live and who would die. Let's hope no ministers ever have to take such decisions for real. But you are now free to leave the Crisis Command Centre. It was actually quite a traumatic um, set of decisions. I found it quite difficult to, in some ways, dealing with the other two ministers because I felt that, you know, as we'd reached a decision-making process, invariably one of them immediately swung and changed their minds. There was a real sense that they were making very tough, yet very important decisions that had to be made. Running the country, scary. I certainly would consider it in five or six years' time. Being a minister clearly would give one the opportunity to then, uh, influence events across a broad spectrum. 
of activity. I think I'd rather be Prime Minister though.